Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is James Wright, who is President Emeritus and Elazar Wheelock Professor of History at Dartmouth College. He is the 2010 Jefferson Lecturer at Berkeley. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Wright, how welcome to Berkeley. I'm delighted to be here, Harry, and I'm delighted to join you on this program. And tell us a little about uh, your background. Where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Wisconsin, in Madison, uh, but I uh, was raised in uh, Galena, Illinois, uh, an old mining town on uh, the Mississippi River. Uh, my uh, family, uh, nobody in my family had ever gone to college, uh, and so uh, my dad had gone for a few months during the Depression. I, I need to correct that. But. And, and looking back, how do you think uh, your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, that, that's an interesting question. Obviously, they did shape my thinking about the world and who I am. But, uh, you know, I learned from them uh, certainly uh, discipline and, uh, and uh, the capacity to look out for myself. Uh, They're loving and supportive parents. Uh, one of my grandfathers was a miner and the other was a farm worker. And uh, we, we certainly did not have much money uh, growing up. Uh, I remember rats in our apartment. I remember staying at my grandparents and not having uh, lights or running water in their house. And it was, uh, it was, it was a different era, but uh, there was a lot of love and a lot of support around. And in, in high school, did you have any teachers who pointed you in the direction of, of history, or did that all come later? Oh, I always loved history. I loved to read history. I loved to study history. But uh, I was not a good high school student because, uh, because I, I, I never thought about going on to college even. It was not something that was part of our culture. It was not something that was really part of my family. And uh, I enjoyed school. Uh, teachers would say to me, you could be a far better student. But it was never clear to me why I needed to be or wanted to be a far better student. So I was a slow starter. And, and what about the interest in uh, political history? Did that come later also? I think that Did, came later. Yeah, yeah. After, after I uh, started studying history in college and at the University of Wisconsin, I, I became more and more interested in political history, absolutely. Now, you, you went from high school to the Marine Corps. Uh, tell us about how that came about, and, and a, I, a, a number of your fellow students did that instead yeah. of going to college. My high school graduating class in 1957 had uh, 60 students. At that time, it was the largest graduating class in my high school in this small Illinois town, and uh, so I presume half of us were, were boys and half girls, but whatever the number was, uh, five of us joined the Marines, and probably another four or five uh, joined the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Uh, uh, I should think more than went to college uh, that year. And so uh, uh, we joined the Marines because we just decided we wanted to be Marines, I guess, uh, caught up in, in uh, stories about the Marine Corps. And uh, it uh, struck me as a good way to spend a couple of years to delay uh, going to work in the mines or someplace else locally. And, and what year would that have been, and how old were you when you went? I was 17 when I, when I enlisted. I turned 18 uh, within a few months, and I was in from 1957 to 1960. It was a, it was a, a time when uh, I was not uh, shot at, and I was not asked to shoot at anyone. So it was a, it was a good time. Mm -hmm. and, and what did you uh, learn from that experience? I mean, what, what did being a Marine teach you about life, and, uh, and how did it affect your later life? Well, it's, 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 it's something I reflect on more as, as I get older, and I think that uh, uh, being a Marine uh, uh, taught me uh, to have self-confidence, a sense of discipline, uh, to know how to work as part of a group, uh, to depend upon other people who are part of my team. It certainly uh, taught me those things, absolutely. And, and where, where were you stationed? Uh, well, I was uh, stationed most of the time over at Kaneohe Bay in Hawaii, and I spent some time in Atsugi, Japan. I shipped out of uh, Treasure Island uh, right here in, in the bay and I came back to Treasure Island and that's where I was uh, discharged uh, in from the Marine Corps in the spring of 1960. Mm -hmm. And and can it, can it be said that the Marines broaden your horizon in the sense of uh, you were abroad too in Japan. I was. I was right? in Japan. And I yeah. loved I loved Japan. Uh, and uh, later, when I would go to when I went to school and when I decided to go to graduate school, I would have become a Japanese historian. I think, uh, mm. except uh, I, I had a barrier of language, and I just as, as an older student, mm -hmm. by then I had a family. Uh, I couldn't uh, invest the time it would require uh, to learn the language well enough to do research. But I loved Japan. I never got back to Japan for another uh, 30 years, mm. I guess. Uh, but I've enjoyed a number of trips there over the last uh, 20 years. 
So after the Marine Corps, you decided to go uh, uh, to college and get an, and and how were were you eligible for benefits to no, do that? No, not then. I wasn't. Yeah. Uh, there were no peace time. There was not a peacetime GI Bill. Later, there was a peacetime GI Bill when I was in graduate school that that retroactively covered people of my generation. I think I received a check of a hundred dollars a month or something like that, which mm -hmm. was still real money in those days. But I. Uh, I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin at Platteville, which is right across the border from uh, the Galena, Illinois, where I lived. I lived at home uh, for the first part of it. Uh, and after joining the Marines to avoid going to work in the mines, uh, I ended up working in the mines. I worked for Kraft Foods in a Swiss cheese plant. Uh, mm -hmm. I worked as a janitor. I worked as a bartender. And uh, I ended up uh, going to work in the mines, which was an interesting experience. And, and let's work. talk about that. Uh, you, you actually were... Uh, uh, an explosives guy in the mine. I was. T you, tell you, us you, about you, that, because there must have been. <laughs> sounds like there was more danger in that than there was in the Marines. Oh, there, there probably was. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you've done your research. Yes. No, I, I was. Uh, I was working on an underground, uh, and uh, one of the shift bosses came to me one day. I was working on a drill machine, sort of a backup on a drill machine, an assistant, where they were drilling holes in the face uh, for, for setting explosives. And he said he had an opening as a powder man. And since I was a Marine, I must know something about dynamite. Would I like to be a powder man? I said, I never touched dynamite in my mm -hmm. life. And I said, how much more will you pay me? And he said, I'll give you 20 cents more an hour. So I went from like 215 to 235 an hour. And I did a quick calculation. I said, sure, I'll be a powder man. Uh, show me what to do. And so I uh, became a powder man. Uh, and I worked uh, setting dynamite charges. And it was a an interesting experience. Uh, it uh, obviously handling explosives is is a dangerous thing, but I'm not sure that 21, 22 year olds uh, think about those things very much. Far more dangerous was the trimming. Mm -hmm. We'd have to go in after an explosion and, and sort of trim off the the loose rock before they uh, came in and started hauling it away. And that's that that could be dangerous. And there was somebody killed uh, one uh, one summer when I was working there uh, doing that, where he started trimming, and, and a lot of the uh, a lot of the roof came down on him. So, so I guess this this was a good training for dealing with faculty when you uh, became a well. A you, you, you certainly find your way through a lot of things, but you know, I I, I kept it, and I would tell Dartmouth students this story. And when I was president of Dartmouth, I had on my desk a little knife mm -hmm. uh, that I used to to use because uh, when you set dynamite charges, there, there's the paraffin wrapper, the red wrapper on a stick of dynamite, and you would split that. And you'd tamp the sticks into the hole, and you'd split the paraffin so that the dynamite would would collapse, and you could push it in there tighter. And I kept this little. Uh, it was basically a, a homemade uh, powder knife. It was a little piece of steel that had been sharpened, and there's some electric tape around it. And I kept it there, and I would show it to students. Uh, and uh, tell them I've always had it on my desk, and it reminds me where it is that I came from, and I hoped uh, that they would never forget where they came from either. You, you must have also learned uh, during this period, you're, because we're, you, we're talking about being an undergraduate, and then at the same time working in the mines on the weekend, a kind of a, they're very different realms to say the least, and, but, but you mastered that, which I guess must have been an important learning experience. To, I worked very to, hard. Yeah. I worked very hard, but it, it, the, my, when I was underground, uh, that was in the summers I did that, but uh, on weekends I worked at the mine when, I was, uh, when classes were in session as a watchman, and it was uh, overnight on Saturday and Sunday night basically making sure the pumps were still running, that you, that you kept the fires uh, stoked up during the winter. We had coal, coal fires in some of the buildings and that there were no fires on the grounds. They're just uh, looking after things. And so that, those jobs, uh, that job rather, allowed me to, uh, to spend the night sitting there uh, reading and uh, doing my homework. Hmm. So as an undergraduate, that's when you were able to, to act on your earlier interest in history? I decided, well, I, I, I had a double major in history and English. I loved, uh, I loved literature and I loved history and I, uh, I did a double major, uh, but I, I really, and I also was preparing to be a, a secondary school teacher, a high school teacher. I did student teaching and training and uh, was prepared to get certified as a high school teacher. But I, I had some remarkable young faculty members uh, at that time. The school was growing as schools were in the 1960s. Uh, uh, Roger Daniels, a very, very uh, 
uh, a wonderful historian uh, who uh, recently retired, uh, has written on uh, the Japanese in California and the, and the camps. And, and Roger uh, was his first teaching job. And Roger encouraged uh, me to think about graduate school and history. And uh, I was willing to think about it. I had no idea what it was. Uh, and uh, I applied for and received a Danforth Fellowship, which allowed me basically to go to any university in the country to graduate school. And I ended up going to the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, and part of the reason for that was that I did a senior thesis uh, as, uh, as an undergraduate uh, on mining in, in Galena, the, hmm. his, the history of the opening up of the lead mines in uh, my hometown. And, and I, there were some papers in the local library that nobody had ever looked at of the first, the first federal superintendent of mines out there. And it was, a, it was an interesting uh, experience. The government managed it. It has some relevance, some real relevance uh, uh, for Californians uh, and for people in the West. Uh, the government managed those mines because lead was such an important uh, commodity for, the, for, for paint and most importantly for ordnance, for bullets. And uh, so the government uh, controlled these mines and managed them. And uh, it was uh, considered by the 1840s to have been a failure. Uh, and I think uh, it was unfairly considered a failure, but there's a lot of political pressure to, to make the mines available privately. And uh, had, had in the middle 1840s, the government decided it was not a failure. Uh, they may have had a different approach uh, when gold was discovered out here a few years later and elsewhere in the, in the Rocky Mountain West with all the mining there, but they kept pointing back to this experience and saying, we can't uh, try mm. to control uh, federally these lands, let's just open them up uh, to individual prospectors and entrepreneurs. And, and I wouldn't want to project what might have happened had they done it differently, but uh, certainly it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, not, it was a quite a co sharp coincidence and uh, had real consequences that this failed. So that was my thesis, and I decided I wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin and work with Alan Bogue. Actually, I was going to go to Iowa. Alan Bogue was at the University of Iowa because people had told me that he was a good man to work on, on land policy and management of lands. And uh, he moved from uh, Iowa to Wisconsin in my senior year, and because I had a Danforth Fellowship, I was able to change my mind and say, now I think I'll go to the University of Wisconsin, which of course is one of the great American history programs in the country. And who there uh, also influenced you? Other people? Because I, I believe there you, you acquired quantitative skills? I did. Yeah, yeah. I did. But, but I did first my master's thesis as an expansion on my undergraduate honors thesis, and, and the University of State Historical Society of Wisconsin published that as a book, uh, the Galena Lead District. And I was very pleased as an undergrad, mm. as, a, as a graduate student, to, to get a book published. But Alan Bogue actually uh, was really doing the, uh, the new political history at that time. He was writing a book on the Congress during the Civil War. And I became more and more interested in, in quantitative measurement. I worked with the Inter-University Consortium for Political Research at the University of Michigan. I got data sets for them. And, and my, my, my interest in mining, uh, both personally uh, for what I grew up, uh, then, then intellectually because of my thesis work and uh, the Galena Lead District book led me to think about looking at politics and mining in a western state and uh, I decided to work on populism in Colorado for my uh, dissertation and uh, I used uh, data analysis for that. I was uh, in, in the early 70s, late 60s, one of the quote new political historians. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually have your book here which I'll show the politics of populism uh, and I, I wanted to read something from the book because uh, in the introduction you're explaining uh, 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 why you became interested in the politics of populism. You say third parties are a function of the existing political structure, the responsiveness of established parties, the accessibility of political institutions and decision makers, the extent of democratic processes, and the general sense of political efficacy. Consequently, it is altogether appropriate that populism be studied in its political context. I read that and I said, gee whiz, that sounds really relevant to today. So, yeah. And, and so I wanted to ask you. Well, remember, it was the 60s, though, when I wrote that as well, the yeah. late 60s. So it, it, was, it was relevant then. I mean, the, 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 the settlers in Colorado, and, and, and many of them originally were miners, but there are farmers out on the high plains, actually cattlemen first, and then increasingly farmers. 
uh, populism in the western states uh, was considered largely an agricultural movement, and, but in Colorado, it really was the miners. It was uh, it was uh, the the working underground miners up in the mountains that provide the backbone of populism, and they would go on to become radical union members, the Western Federation of Miners, the Wobblies, and other other groups. There there was a radicalism there, and, and there was a sense. Uh, that the two political parties in Colorado in the first instance and then nationally were not representing their interests. Uh, populism uh, is, is a term, lowercase p, uh, that's used, uh, I think, quite generously to describe any number of movements in American politics. But the, the populism of, 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 of the late 19th century, the populism uh, that finally was decapitated by the Democratic Party when they nominated William Jennings Bryan, for president in 1896, and Bryan reached out to bring in the, uh, the, the, the disaffected Western agrarians uh, into his party. Uh, but uh, uh, that populism was one that, that was really had a very strong uh, anti-corporate sentiment. Uh, there was a sense that individuals were losing control of their own lives uh, to railroad companies, uh, to large mining companies, uh, to large land companies, uh, to institutions uh, that no longer were responsive to individuals. And so rather than, as people use populism today, to refer to an anti-government sentiment, these populists were looking to the government to come in and assist them. But uh, that was not uh, at all unusual or, or uh, uh, in, in, in the West, because the, the settlers of the West had come to depend greatly upon the United States government. It was the United States government that built roads, that built railroads, that uh, delivered their mail, that uh, set up military posts, that uh, protected them and advanced their good work, uh, that through its land policy encouraged settlement and development. And so there was not an antagonism in the Western states then towards the government per se. There would be an antagonism toward government policy, specific things, but the, they looked out to the government as that institution representing them that could perhaps intermediate on their behalf with these uh, large corporations that were increasingly able to, to control their lives. Is there a lesson from this, these studies for today in the sense that uh, you're suggesting at the end of the book that the parties really adapted to the grievances and so populism uh, uh, was you know it passed from the scene, so to speak. I any lessons there for today, or is it well, so? I, in, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's. I would. I would be hard pressed to to sort of do a linear thing yeah. that would lead to today, because I think uh, today, what, what what we see are, are 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 dissidents, unhappy people on both the left and the right, and as they pull the two major political parties in their respective traditions, it's not, sure to, it's not clear to me that there is a real resolution for most of us likely to come through that process. Mm -hmm. So you went, uh, after your degree, your first teaching position was at Dartmouth, and then you stayed there. I stayed there. I was uh, offered a job at Dartmouth in 1968 uh, as an assistant professor of history. They uh, offered me $10,000 a year, which was uh, real money. <laughs> and uh, I jumped at it, uh, and I went there, and, and I loved teaching. I loved teaching undergraduates. I loved teaching Dartmouth undergraduates. Uh, because uh, with, and I would always think of my students as students who, very few of whom would go on professionally to be a historian or a history teacher. And I, I wanted to have the opportunity with, with some of the best students in the country to let them know how a historian thinks, uh, what it is that one can, what it is that history uh, can provide for us as we think about the problems of our time. And, and, and briefly, what was that? In other words, well, what I kept, was, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. I kept trying to tell them that the, the, the thing they have to look out for is the idea of, of history as sort of analogy or history repeating itself, and, and where people would look to history and say, aha, here's the lesson. Uh, that uh, we need to use uh, from history. And there's a real danger uh, to that because uh, there is a uniqueness to each situation. What we have to learn from history is how to think about how this, this particular situation evolved, what are the component parts of it. But we, we are free agents. We have a free will then to determine how it is we're gonna respond to this. And, and uh, when I was, uh, and we'll be talking later about uh, uh, my, uh, my lecture uh, yesterday and, and some of my work, but uh, when you look at, at something like uh, the Vietnam War, uh, there is a tremendous uh, 
uh, reassessment now of our foreign policy with people trying to, quote, learn the lessons of history from Vietnam. And uh, what I point out is that those people who led us into Vietnam uh, thought they had learned the lessons of history. And they were, they were, theirs was a history of analogy. They looked to Munich. They looked to the French at Dien Bien Phu. And they said, here are the lessons that we have to remember. We can't make those mistakes again. And so I think that uh, one has to be very careful uh, using history uh, in that way. Uh, Vietnam was, it was a very complicated, it was an emotionally uh, a difficult time. The emotions of Vietnam are still very much uh, part of our uh, calculations. But I think we have the lessons now that you, that you hear when, you, when, when President Obama uh, spoke at West Point about uh, his determination to go into Afghanistan with more troops. Uh, uh, that, that, that we are not going to repeat some of the mistakes of Vietnam. Well, that, that is something that we have to try to avoid, repeating mistakes. But we don't, we don't avoid repeating mistakes simply by pretending that now we're going to do something totally different, and that's a way to avoid mistakes. So, so what you're suggesting is that the skills of the historian help you think about the present by helping you analyze the dynamics of the present situation. So that the, the, being a historian, having studied me in the past, uh, you've done that kind of analysis, but there's no link between the two you, things. It, it's thinking about the context yeah. of things, and, and context is, is, uh, is something that, 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 that relates to history. It's, it's more than simply the, the present context. It's more than the physical or environmental context. There, there, there are a set of beliefs, there are a set of, set of attitudes, there are a set of behaviors. Uh, there, there are a set of, of values that have evolved among individuals and groups uh, over a period of time. And being able to understand them, I think, is the first step that we need to have in trying to uh, determine how it is we're going to respond to situations that we face. So, so how did this, these insights help you when you came to be president of uh, Dartmouth? I, th I think... Uh, being a historian uh, gives you a perspective, and I hope uh, a sense of humor as well. Uh, I, I, I often would say that, that it, it is uh, not a good form of history uh, to sort of look back and say, well, in 1968 or 1948, people faced this sort of a problem, and that was even worse than ours. Uh, we, 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 we cannot make ourselves feeling ba feel better by finding people who prior to us uh, who, who had reason to feel even worse than we do. That, that's not a lesson of history. You, you have to think of your own way of dealing with situations. And I do think that, that historians, uh, good historians, have a sense of perspective, a sense of humor. Uh, the, 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 there is always a sense of emergency and immediacy uh, that we face as decision makers. And I think historians, I hope, have some particular instinct uh, to recognize that not all things are urgent and immediate, but you have, but there are some things that are, and you have to be able to try to instinctively understand what they are. And it would be hard for me to sort out those 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 pieces of my intellectual training that 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 specifically provided me with a recipe. Or, or a means of approaching problems. I, I don't know if I could do that, but, but is, clearly they did. It, it, let me ask you the question this way, and maybe there isn't an answer. Is there, is there a skill set that, that uh, uh, you can see as necessary for uh, running a, a great university like Dartmouth? I think, uh, I think those who can be most successful uh, leading uh, any complicated organization uh, uh, have to understand that, 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 that complicated organizations uh, uh, still need to be reduced to, 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 to some rather simple values and priorities. Who are we and what are we about? Uh, I think uh, running any complicated organization, particularly a university, uh, where, you, where you have to reach out and bring people in, where there are the, you have to understand the processes at work. You have to obviously respect the faculty and uh, their role, and not simply respect them as people that need to be briefed on what's happening, but they need to be brought in in trying to think about how it is uh, that you might address uh, situations. Uh, but uh, presidents uh, of great institutions are not, are not simply those who, who do a referendum and look for the lowest common denominator among the faculty or, or any constituency to determine what to do. They have to have their own values. They have to have their own priorities. They have to stand for certain things. They have to make that very clear. 
this is what I stand for. And, 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 the, and, and standing for things in a way that's firm but not inflexible or stubborn, I think, is just a crucial uh, value. You've got to know that there are times to, to back off a little bit. Uh, and uh, you've got to know when there are times that, the, you know, no, 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 no. I want to assert again why I think this is the way to do it. And it's, it's a balancing act. Uh, uh, I, I'm a great, uh, politics has become uh, a, a pejorative word in, in our society, but I'm a political historian. I think uh, politics today, as it's practiced in many parts of this country and nationally, is uh, something that, that I do find uh, repugnant. I, I don't like the way. Because of what it's become. Because of what it's become. But, but mm -hmm. politics at its very best is the way that, 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 that free and open societies and institutions and organizations uh, uh, work together and, and, and allow themselves a process to finally uh, determine how it is uh, to make decisions and then to make a decision and to move on with it. Politics is a, is a good thing in a democratic and free and open society. It sounds like uh, all elements of your background, which we've just discussed, contributed to your understanding of leadership and, and not just the fact that you had held many roles within Dartmouth's... Uh, oh, but uh, you, don't you think that's true of each of us? And it's hard for me to sort of do this, this the introspection or the self-analysis. I want to write something for my grandchildren uh, and not for a bigger audience about my own my own background, and, and I want to reflect on these things. But you know, I, I, I grew up, as, as I said, in, in a relatively poor family, but I didn't never felt poor because everyone in my community was more or less the same. So the, there was no sense of hierarchy uh, there, at least not an obvious sense of hierarchy. Uh, I uh, went to, to, to Catholic schools for, for several years uh, with nuns. I was an altar boy in the days of the Latin Mass. Uh, uh, I was a Marine at age uh, 17. I, I studied history. Uh, I mean, all of these things uh, contribute finally to, uh, to the way that I think and relate to the world, but I, I would be hard pressed to, to sort out which of these things make me function the way that I do or think the way that I do. Mm -hmm. uh, as president of Dartmouth, uh, I know that you were involved in the reforming of the undergraduate curriculum, or maybe even before. Talk a little about that. I mean, what, what were some of the dilemmas in, in making undergraduate education more relevant? I, Dartmouth has had really two comprehensive curriculum reviews, I think, in the last 60 or 70 years. And I chaired both of them, which is at least one more than, than, than any faculty member should be asked <laughs> to take on in his lifetime because it, it, it's a complicated thing, but it's a wonderful assignment as well. And I did one, uh, I was still an associate professor uh, when the president and the dean of faculty asked me to chair this task force in the late 1970s. And then as dean of faculty, uh, I organized another one and chaired it myself in, uh, in uh, 1990 because we, I wanted us to still try to think about addressing some things, most of which uh, we had not successfully addressed before. I think that uh, you know, the, the curriculum, in, well, when I think of the curriculum, I'm really, I'm really talking about the degree requirements because the curriculum itself uh, needs to, to evolve based on the various disciplines that are part of a curriculum. I don't think that there's a master plan or there can't be. There may be a master plan or at least a, a, a strong assertive faculty committee uh, that determines, okay, we, we don't need this many courses on this subject uh, because there are not that many students interested in it. I, and I think that those are fair and legitimate questions, but th they really have to do with the faculty looking after the business of the curriculum. Uh, we were focusing on the degree requirements. And so my interest was and always was, always was what is it uh, uh, that, uh, that a graduate of a school like Dartmouth uh, should have as part of his intellectual background, his, uh, his, uh, his CV. And, and that's, that's a hard question because everyone has their own very specific thing that they think need be a part of that. As a historian, I, I have trouble thinking of anyone uh, who can go on to positions of leadership and responsibility without having some appreciation of history, obviously. But there are others who will say the same of, of mathematics, uh, of economics, of, uh, of, uh, of physics, of, of whatever, you name the field, and they can make a compelling case. And, and so we tried to think about those skills uh, that students should know, and, and, and we also talked about the, 
the ways in which uh, a major should prepare them. And I don't look at a liberal arts college as, as a major as being sort of pre-vocational. Uh, we, we have an advantage in that in thinking of the liberal arts. I, I looked upon a major as a way in which one uh, developed uh, uh, confidence and mastery of a discipline, understanding some of the methods and the tools of a discipline, understanding some of the history of the discipline. And my interest, and then we, we finally secured this, were, were each student sort of having some sort of culminating experience in their major, a paper or something else where they would pull together the work of the major. Uh, we, we were able to get uh, requirements for uh, uh, interdisciplinary courses uh, into the curriculum, and I think uh, that is important. I believe in disciplines, but life is interdisciplinary. And the problems of life are, are solved by thinking uh, outside the boundaries of discipline. So we wanted to, to try to do that. We changed some of the old science requirements uh, uh, where students simply had to take some courses in the science division uh, to, to ask that they took a lab science. I, I want, I, you can't learn, and I'm, I'm, I am not a scientist. Uh, I had trouble with science in high school and never touched it again. Uh, chemistry, it was, it, was, it was difficult for me. But I think you have you, you can't know how scientists work unless you get into a lab and take a, a laboratory course, and so we required uh, that. And it was it was an interesting process. I think it's probably time to to assess some of those things again. But it, it, it's it's it, these things are not written uh, into concrete. Uh, some people would write them into concrete. Everyone who who presumes to have an education should have read this, should have studied that, should have done that, and. And uh, I, I could make the same argument about a number of things, but we're talking about a process of educating uh, young people to enable them to go on to a lifetime of continuing education, because education is not the, a degree is not the end of a process of education. Educated well and right, those students who, who walk out of an institution such as Dartmouth or Berkeley are prepared for a lifetime of continuing to learn. And what I keep trying to tell uh, our students and our faculty and others that that none of us can predict uh, what students should know to function well in the world of 2025, which isn't very far off. And uh, if they want to test us, go back to, to, to 1995 and uh, think about how the world has changed since 1995 and think what courses we might have required in 1995 to prepare students for the world of 2010. And I'm not sure that there are courses as much as skills that would have enabled uh, them to do that. And so what I tell students is that I want them to know how to, to relearn, uh, to learn again, and importantly, to unlearn. Because there are some things that we're teaching today that they're gonna have to unlearn sometime in their lives. Somebody's gonna say, you know, that, that no longer is a legitimate way to understand that problem. That no longer is a legitimate interpretation. That no longer is an in legitimate met methodology. And those people who cannot unlearn at age 40 or 50 or 60 are those who are, who are gonna have the greatest difficulty continuing to function well. Uh, I know you've been involved in committees that are looking at the challenges of, of higher education as, as we look ahead. Uh, especially a lot is changing because of the, the economic collapse of, of 208 and so on. Uh, what, what are your reflections on, on uh, do you think uh, universities will adapt or will they have to change themselves drastically? I think universities uh, uh, will have to adapt, they will have to change, but so will our society's understandings of universities. I think one of the unfortunate things is, is a concept of, of education as being yet another interest group uh, that is uh, sort of elbowing its way of some sort of public treasury or public trough. Education is about the infrastructure of this republic, of this nation, of this society, of this state. And un until we can understand that, uh, we are going to continue to lose ground. You know, in, in, in the early 1970s, uh, the United States uh, uh, led the world in terms of completion of high school, with high school education. Uh, we, we did for most of the, of the 20th century, about 77% of our students uh, had uh, had a high school, of our people rather, the population uh, in their 20s and beyond had a high school education. Now it's 67%. And now we rank uh, something like 21st out of 27 industrial nations in the world. We are losing ground in something pretty fundamental. In the early 1970s, we ranked number two in the world 
in terms of, of, of college degree. Uh, we were behind only the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union had a far more lockstep method of marching everyone through some sort of uh, degree programs. Now we are 11th, and we're losing ground. We're losing ground to, to the nations of Western Europe. We're losing ground to, to Korea and Japan and to other countries. Uh, and uh, we still are among the highest. If you look at those over age 55, we're, we're second in the world. But if you look at those in, in their 20s and early 30s, uh, we're 11th. What does that mean? It means that this generation who are going to be taking over leadership in this country uh, do not have uh, the educational tools widely distributed. We are not doing well uh, with minority groups. We're not doing well with, with, with recent immigrants. And, and so I think that there has to be an understanding that education uh, is a crucial part of the infrastructure of this republic. It's as crucial as highways or railroad lines or airports or bridges or anything else. In fact, it are those people who will build the bridges and the highways uh, and, the, and the railroad lines are going to be well-educated people. And uh, we have to simply do better than that. Now, Dartmouth uh, is, a, is an institution uh, that, that is always going to have a small number of students. And, and my, my vision for Dartmouth was to make certain uh, that it was not simply a place for the privilege. And that's been a view that's been shared for a number of years. It was not mine, obviously. It was not original to me. But I was very pleased. Uh, that that half of our students uh, were on financial aid. I was very pleased that uh, 15, 16 percent of our students were first generation college students. I liked as a first generation college student myself going out on the campus and thinking, you know, about one in six of these students have a mother and father who could not have imagined coming to a place like this, and that's crucial. Uh, where we're sitting now, uh, Berkeley, it, 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 it is a flagship institution. It, it is a flagship not simply uh, for California. It is a flagship uh, university for this country. It is a flagship university for this world. And I think we all have to be concerned if a place like Berkeley uh, is having difficulty making certain that it's accessible and available to a wide range of students and making certain that the faculty here have the opportunity to continue to expand that which we know to force us to relearn those things that we have to relearn. Your, your lecture here was on democracy and, and veterans, and I want to talk a little about that. And tell us a little how you became interested in this problem of educational access for returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. Well, it, it, it's interesting. I, as, 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 a, as a Marine, and, and uh, the, there is sort of a once a Marine, always a Marine, but I was not somebody who spent my my uh, waking hours uh, thinking about being a Marine. Uh, I, I had friends at Dartmouth uh, that knew me for 20, 30 years, perhaps, uh, who weren't aware that I had once been the Marines. Uh, uh, it was not, I was proud of it, but it was not something that, that I wore on my chest. And uh, it, during the Iraq War, uh, early on, it was uh, the Battle of Fallujah in, in uh, late uh, 2004, and some of the accounts that I read about the fighting there, some of the Marines there, just, just touched me deeply. I can't explain why then and there it did, uh, but it did. And I spoke to a friend of mine who had been, a, who was a retired Marine officer, a Dartmouth graduate, and said, I would like to do something, uh, and I'm not sure what. And he said, why don't you go visit the, the, uh, the wounded uh, troops at Bethesda and talk about an uh, education. And I said, how can I get permission to do that? And he said, I still have a friend in the Commandant's office, let me check. And he got back to me and got me permission to go to the Bethesda Naval Hospital, uh, where there were a lot of Marines at that time. Many of them were, had, had been wounded in, in Fallujah. And so I went down there and I went bed to bed and uh, talked to them, asked them what happened to them, and tried to, to encourage them to think about continuing their education. Somebody encouraged me to go uh, right after that to Walter Reed Hospital where I met with the students. And I came back to Bethesda. And after the second or third trip, I realized that the questions that these uh, young wounded veterans were asking me, uh, does, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about going uh, to, to a college near home in uh, Texas, and uh, do they have a major in X? Or I'm, I'm hoping uh, to enroll in, in a school back home in California. And uh, because I've lost both my legs, uh, are all the buildings accessible? Do they have elevators every place? Pretty basic stuff, but there's no one individual that can wander through 
a, a hospital or any group and answer those questions about every institution. So I contacted the American Council on Education. David Ward was president of ACE is the largest umbrella group for American institutions ranging from, from community colleges uh, to, uh, uh, to the great universities of this country, the great research universities. And uh, David was willing to try to set up a counseling program at a, at a couple of hospitals where we could, he could then get somebody from the institution of interest to answer questions. And uh, I agreed to help raise the money for it. And I raised $350,000 to start it. And it was pretty easy money uh, to raise, Harry. I, it, was, it was really quite something. And, and, and that process then got me involved in some other things. Uh, the GI Bill, I realized that it really was not providing means for these uh, young men and women to be able to pursue their college education. Somebody connected me with Senator Jim Webb of, of Virginia, a former Marine, and he and I uh, spent an afternoon uh, talking about how to proceed. He had a bill that wasn't moving along, and we, we met with Senator John Warner, who was also a Marine, and we, we talked about uh, uh, how to make certain that private institutions would have access to a new GI Bill because the, the, at that time there's a disposition to, to top the, the tuition payment at a level that would not allow them to go to private schools. And I said, look, you know, if so many people uh, had an opportunity to come to private schools. And so we worked out what was called the Yellow Ribbon Program, uh, whereby uh, I suggested that, that, the, that the difference or the delta, as Senator Warner called it, uh, between the uh, the, the top uh, tuition at a private, uh, public institution in the state and that of the private would be split equally between Veterans Affairs and the institution. So we would have to put up some money. And that was, uh, the, the became called the Yellow Ribbon Program and that was part of the GI Bill. So I uh, was pleased when this passed and was signed. I, it, it was difficult because there was a lot of resistance to it because the Defense Department thought it would discourage reenlistment, which was important to them. And uh, I just, a few weeks ago, uh, 10 days ago, I made my uh, uh, 20th visit. I was out at Bethesda Hospital mm -hmm. and made my 20th hospital visit. I continue to do this, continue to encourage uh, young people to think about uh, going to college because I, I think that this, the, the, the group that I work with on the college board, uh, their task force that, that, that looked at the way in which we are declining in terms of uh, completion of college, uh, uh, this is this is a part of the, of the response to that, uh, because there are parts of the country, there there are cities, there are neighborhoods, there are communities uh, where nobody goes to college. It's not just randomly. It's it, you know there are certain places in this country, certain high schools where 95 percent of the graduates will go to will go to college, and there there are other places where five or 10 percent will go to college. And we need to to begin to break through that culturally. And a lot of these veterans are coming from these smaller communities where people have not gone to college. And so I'm encouraging them. I, I'm always telling them that they can do anything they want to do. They've already demonstrated that. And uh, it's, we have now 16 uh, at Dartmouth, uh, uh, and uh, I, I try to keep in touch with them without, uh, without being a mother hen or pestering them. But my door, even as a, as a president emeritus, is open to them. And uh, they're remarkable uh, young men. These are all these are all men. At As a president, uh, you're you were able to kind of uh, influence the the world view, so to speak, of what was happening to these uh, young people and what we needed to give them. Uh, as a historian, uh, you you look at the present situation and and in your lecture, you you raise some very interesting points. And let's touch on them. The, the soldiers now. Uh, despite the difficulty of, of moving in the direction that you just moved, are, are being treated uh, with respect in a way they weren't after the Vietnam War. Yes, when, when I was invited by the uh, committee and by uh, uh, Chancellor Bergenau to, to give the Jefferson Lecture, uh, the, the committee had, had, uh, had an interest in what I was doing for veterans. And I, I said, I don't want to just reflect on what I've done for veterans. It's, it's, powerful and important as that is to me, I'd like to also think about it historically. And so I spent the last several months uh, really focusing on the history of, of veteran policy in the United States. And you don't have to spend too much time in, in, in looking at this uh, to realize that the real outlier is Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that, that the policies and the support have evolved with some ups and downs over time. But in terms of attitude, 
Corps veterans. Uh, we celebrate the veterans today. It's hard to go to a baseball game or a football game or watch the Super Bowl next Sunday. There'll be some salute to, 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 to armed forces there and to veterans. As part of our culture, we, we are embracing and thanking uh, these veterans and they are do that. Uh, we did not do that with the Vietnam veterans and that, that's what increasingly uh, became an intriguing question to me and I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about this. I don't have the answers by any means, but uh, there have been many unpopular wars in American history. I think that Vietnam uh, is an outlier in the sense that, that I, think, I, I don't think you'll find any other occasion when the public or some significant portion of the public has faulted those troops who have fought in these unpopular wars for the wars. And uh, we did not treat uh, the Vietnam veterans well. I think we realized that as a country by the late 1970s, uh, there was a beginning change in that. You can see it by looking at, at Gallup and Harris polls, uh, a recognition and acknowledgement that they were not well treated and an embrace of them. You can see it beginning in the 80s. President Reagan, really President Carter started and then President Reagan, I think, uh, really reached out uh, to the veterans. It was important for him uh, strategically in the way that he was thinking about the world. It was important to him uh, uh, politically, but it was also personally important to him. When I say veterans, I really mean the armed forces as much as the veterans and embracing them. And I think by, by the time 9-11 uh, came around, we already were disposed to be supportive of the armed forces. And I think that, that there, there are really few, if any, events in American history that had the emotional, that gave us the emotional jolt that 9-11 gave us. It, it caused a lot of grief, it caused a lot of fear, and it caused a, a sense of, of, of true national unity. And I think that, that the armed forces became even more crucial to us. They were our protectors, and that caused us, I think, to, uh, to reach out to them. And, and I think the great, the great irony uh, to me is that uh, uh, the war in Iraq uh, very quickly uh, became an unpopular war. There, mm. was a, there was significant disagreement about whether the war was justified when, when it began in March of 2003. And within a year or two, I think that there was an increasing swing in the United States. There were no weapons of mass destruction. There was greater and greater resistance to the idea of the war, and, uh, and uh, it was an unpopular war. Afghanistan was more popular because of 9-11, the, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, but I think uh, within the last couple of years, it clearly has become unpopular. This has not been transferred to the kids who are fighting over there, mm -hmm. unlike Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam was perhaps no less popular and uh, no, no less unpopular, whatever the right description is, than, the war, than these two wars today. But unlike Vietnam, we're not blaming the guys who are fighting it. And I, I'm, I'm going to spend some more time on this because I want to understand better this and some of the consequences of it. Do you, do you have any sense of what the difference was? That, that did, did it have to do with the fact those, that was a draft army, whereas now it's... But you see, that, 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 that's almost, it, it may well have, but, it, but that would have led to greater unpopularity of the war because people were facing the draft. But it should not, that should not have been translated into unpopularity of those who are fighting the war. If anything, we should have embraced them more uh, because they're more representative. In fact, the, 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 it was a blue-collar war. Uh, we think Vietnam. Of, we, Vietnam. Yeah. We think of it as being a war because of the draft that was sort of equal opportunity, uh, but it was not. Remember, there were college uh, mm -hmm. deferments and other sorts of deferments, and uh, uh, the, uh, the kids who were dying in Vietnam tended to be very blue collar in their background, uh, absolutely. But, but I think it is interesting that they were, th there was a draft then, and 62% of, the, of, of, the, uh, of the, the, the troops who were killed in 1969 were draftees. Uh, that, that's significant, uh, that, that, that really says something. And of course, there are a lot being killed, a lot more than, than, than are today. There were, 47,000 plus were killed in combat, another 10, 11,000 were killed uh, in uh, non-combat activities in Vietnam. Uh, but, but I think today they're volunteers. So it's not that they have been dragged unwillingly into the army, they've said, yes, I would like to join. And, and nonetheless, uh, this unpopular war is being carried out by people who are very popular. That's good. I'm surely not being critical of that. I'm trying to understand better mm -hmm. why, we, why we didn't have a better understanding of Vietnam. But the 1960s 
was a time of a, a revolt, uh, a, a revolution against uh, m many of the, the, uh, the mainstays of American culture. And I think that, that you can't minimize that. Uh, there, it, was, it was crucial uh, that, uh, that uh, the people uh, here in the Bay Area, at the University of Wisconsin where I was, there was an open revolt against the conformity that the military seemed to represent. Vietnam was a very well uh, covered war by the press. Uh, there, were, there were far fewer restrictions on coverage of that war than the newsreels that came back from World War II in Korea. And indeed, uh, there, there were fewer restrictions there than there are now in Iraq and Afghanistan. Indeed, beginning with Grenada in the early 1980s, uh, the uh, Defense Department put far more restrictions over the way the press would cover it. And so you had, I think by 1968, there were 630, 640 accredited journalists in Vietnam. And they, they could oftentimes catch a, catch a hop on a helicopter and go someplace and cover something. They, they, and, and, and among the restrictions on them was uh, not to show American troops uh, killed or, or seriously injured. And uh, so that, that took away the capacity uh, to sympathize with these guys. And in fact, you saw instead uh, the Vietnamese. Uh, and and uh, the Vietnamese mm -hmm. suffered horribly in that war, and I don't think we should ever minimize that. And so it was uh, all of a sudden these were the baby killers who were over there. My Lai was, in was a terribly important uh, incident. Uh, and, 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 and by the early 70s, uh, polls were saying that most Americans believed that My Lai was fairly common in Vietnam. So Lieutenant Kelly, uh, rather than the boy next door of World War II, uh, Lieutenant Kelly uh, becomes symbolic of the American uh, kids who are over there, and, and, and Vietnam veterans would would talk about moments of of, of, of tremendous complexity, of, of moral ambiguity, of not knowing how to function in these situations. They would admit to that. Uh, you pointed out in the lecture, and I would like to go over this with our audience, namely the 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 different situation of the the veteran. Uh, of today because of the change in medical technology, the weapons, and, and so on. So, and, and I think you gave it a figure of something like 7.3 to 1 uh, wounded. Talk a little about sure. that to, to, because it's very important uh, to help us understand really the importance of what you've done in terms of saying, well, what will all of these veterans who've been injured, and more of them are being injured and, and survive? Basically, what what? How do we help them? Yeah, in Vietnam, uh, the, the, there were about uh, 2.6 uh, wounded for every one who was killed. So that that meant that that, that we were saving about, you know, of the 3.6 uh, uh, of the number who were wounded, about uh, a significant number of them uh, uh, were were being saved. Uh, 2.6 to one. Uh, in Iraq, it was it's about 7.3 to one. We're saving a lot more of those who are wounded, and I think this is this is a remarkable thing, and it's really due to 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 a lot of factors, uh, to be sure. But I think that that among them are advances in medical technology, uh, particularly speed of delivery. These guys are, are are picked up in a hurry. They're medevaced in a hurry. They're taken to some some full facility hospitals in Iraq, and they're on their way to Germany within a day or two, then they're on their way to Bethesda or Walter Reed or Brook Army Medical Center uh, shortly after that. They're getting tremendous care. They also have uh, uh, body armor uh, that is, is pretty effective in protecting vital organs. But what, what, is, what is happening is that we're saving a lot of people who might well have died in the field or shortly after in a hospital in Vietnam, uh, we're saving them. The, the amputations, there are more amputations. People, body armor is not protecting limbs. Uh, there's more cognitive brain injury. Uh, there, there are more burns. Uh, people are inside of steel vehicles that are hit by IEDs. A significant uh, portion of the, of the, the injured in, in, in Iraq uh, and in Afghanistan, more in Iraq than Afghanistan, uh, are coming from, from explosives where people are inside of steel vehicles. And I think that this means burns. Uh, it means, uh, it means uh, uh, getting their bell rung, as they said, uh, significant concussions. And one needn't go beyond the National Football League study to know that, that, that significant concussions uh, can have a cognitive impact. And I think that, uh, in fact, there's a linkage between that 
and PTSD. And I think that that's a significant problem of veterans coming out from this war. So we need to, 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 to recognize that. I think that the hospitals have been overwhelmed just as the, as the Defense Department uh, did not do a very good job in being able to project to back in 2001 or 2003 that we'd still be fighting in Iraq in 2010 and Afghanistan in 2010. Uh, they, they, nobody, nobody thought we were in for that long of a haul. Uh, they, they did not understand uh, the magnitude of the, of the injuries coming back. And so the hospitals have just been overwhelmed by these numbers. And it's not just the simple numbers coming in, it's also because of, of, of the complexity of, of some of the wounds and injuries uh, that, these, uh, that these veterans uh, are bringing back, that they need to have ongoing treatment, prostheses and uh, fitting for prostheses and, and, and uh, rehabilitation uh, training. The burns are significant. I, I, you know, I, it, it, it's, you know, when I think of some of the, the guys that I've seen and talked to who are in these hospital beds, some, some of them pretty fresh, into the hospital beds, you know, their, their, their stumps sort of taped up and oozing blood and pus because then they can't be fitted for prostheses until all the swelling goes down. It's just, a, it's such a, a difficult time. It just reaches out to you. It's, you know, I, I've spent times there where I want to go outside the hospital and just start crying because of what I've seen. But I've also always been inspired because I've never heard any of these guys whine or complain uh, when I try to encourage them to think about going to school. They, they think they'd like to. What they often say, though, is I really want to go back to my unit. Mm -hmm. and, and at first I was puzzled by that, and I thought, well, the, they, they obviously are far more supportive of the objectives of this war than as the public as a whole. But what I came to realize is that the, the war and the war objectives are, are not uh, significant mm -hmm. uh, in this case. They, they have bonded with their unit and they want to be back. They want to try to help those guys out. And that's a big difference from Vietnam. I think one of the, one of the unfortunate things of Vietnam is that we sent these kids over there individually, not as a unit. And so they would come in as strangers, as the new guy in a unit, and find themselves out on patrol with a group of guys who have been on patrol uh, together for, for, for several weeks or several months. And, it was, uh, and then they would come home, home alone on a charter plane and get out of off the plane at San Francisco airport and you know, nobody there to greet them, nobody to welcome them. Uh, one, one final question uh, and possibly a brief answer. I, is there a way that we can continue to support the soldiers in these ways that you're describing, but at the same time figure out a way to have a, a, a better discussion of the war aims uh, and the direction of our our, our I th yeah, yeah. I, I think there there are two different uh, elements of that. I think we can support you know as as I said yesterday, uh, in a democracy such as ours and, and under a constitution such as ours, the military does not start wars. If they do, we've got a far more fundamental problem. The wars are started by our political leadership. The military fight them at the command of the political leadership. And uh, so the, the issue has less to do, has nothing to do really with the military. It has to do with our political leadership. We don't do a very good job in debating these things. We have not had a declared war, uh, after all, since World War II, since, uh, what, December the 8th, 1941, uh, we declared war against Japan, and then one or two days later against Germany. We've not had a declaration of war uh, since then. Uh, we, uh, we enter into these wars in, uh, in some different ways, in some more complicated ways. And uh, I think that uh, the people are uneasy and uncomfortable. There were certainly uh, complaints and concerns uh, about going to Iraq in the winter of 2002, 2003. There were, there were fewer dissents of the idea of going into Afghanistan. That seemed clearer and crisper. Part of it, the emotions following 9-11, but there was a, in those mountains of Af Afghanistan was Al-Qaeda. Uh, who clearly had ownership over what happened in 9-11. And, and, and most uh, people in this country and internationally understood the need for us to, uh, to take care of that. Uh, Vietnam, uh, you know, the, the Tonkin Gulf resolutions, and, and we know that they were uh, iffy at best in terms of those factors that led to it. Uh, Korea was a police action. Uh, and so we don't have a, a good and a free and an open debate, and we simply have to do that. And then it gets caught, of course, in a lot of emotions. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on that note, and, and uh, I want to thank you for, for being on our program, and thank you for coming to Berkeley to 
uh, to give the Jefferson Lecture on, on such an important topic. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.